So welcome everybody. Um, we're so happy that you came out for the program tonight on food addictions. Um, thank you to Dr. Buster for uh, agreeing to speak to us and share his expertise. Dr. Arvin Busker is originally from Allentown, Pennsylvania. He graduated from the University of Rochester with both a bachelor's and a master's in biomedical engineering, concentrating in medical imaging and optics. He proceeded to get his medical degree from the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he completed his residency at Authority Health underneath Michigan State University's psychiatry program. Dr. Bosker served as a chief resident in his as chief resident in his final year in Michigan, spending much of much time training the first year residents through a series of lectures and mentoring. After finishing his residency in 2019, he started to serve Capital Health as a board certified outpatient psychiatrist, primarily working out of Bordentown, New Jersey. Dr. Bosker is a member of the American Psychiatric Association as well as the Clinical TMS Society. He is a firm believer in approaching mental health holistically, strongly encourages healthy diet and exercise where able, and he does his best to practice what he preaches. He is currently living in Mount Laurel, New Jersey with his wife. Thank you very much, doctor. Take it away. Okay, hi guys. Can, uh, can you hear me, Marsha? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Marsha. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys today about food addictions. Um, you know, so food addictions itself isn't a specific psychiatric diagnosis. Um, you know, when we think of food addictions, we think of things like bulimia and binge eating disorder, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, there's this holy trinity, uh, right, of, of eating disorders, right? And when we talk about that, we talk about, right, bulimia, which is one, binge eating, which is one, but also anorexia. You know, anorexia isn't an eating disorder, uh, or sorry, food addiction per se, but it is an addiction to the behaviors around food. And so for that reason, I did want to include it um, in today's talk, if that's okay with everyone, just because I think it is very, very important to discuss. Um, so I may use the terms food addictions and eating disorders interchangeably, but I hope you understand that they mean very similar things. Um, now, food addictions uh, or eating disorders, this is a very, very broad topic. It's very wide, it's very deep. Um, today's lecture is gonna be a little bit of an introduction, right? We're gonna talk about a few things here that I think are useful for everyone to know, kind of what are food addictions or eating disorders, why they're important. Um, I'm gonna go through some examples on how we can understand them a little bit better and also how we can treat them. Um, at the end, I'm also going to talk about, you know, if there's certain things that we can look out for if you have a loved one or ourselves is struggling with food addictions or eating disorders, some symptoms to look out for, and some things that we can do uh, to help out, some do's and don'ts. Um, now, I wanted to get a sense of where everyone is at with food addictions or eating disorders. Um, I know we set the chat to private. I was hoping that we could get some audience participation. If you can type in kind of just what you do, whether you're retired or you're a student, if you're working. And just give me a number of kind of your understanding of eating disorders, right? Let's just say 10 is you just did your thesis, right, on eating disorders and zero is, you know, next to nothing about this stuff. Um, I'll start talking a little bit here, but I was hoping I could review that. Marsha, if you were able to kind of collect those responses, um, and I think I should be able to see them in the chat also. Um, perfect, okay, they're already coming in here. Uh, so I will say, you know, this topic, if you do have a food addiction or an eating disorder um, and you are joining us, I, I really appreciate you being here. I will say some of the things that we're going to talk about today can be quite intense. Um, so if you need to take a few minutes uh, to take a step back, please do uh, and join us when, you, when you're uh, ready to come back. Um, okay, so I'm getting some responses here. Um, okay, somebody put a 65. Uh, I'm hoping that's your age and not telling me that you know everything there is to know about eating disorders here. Um, okay, good, all right, some good responses here. All right, I appreciate that, guys. Um, so like I said, I, I think so. I think this will be actually a, a quite relevant discussion and it sounds like you know, we don't have any PhD guys here, you know, at least working on their, their eating disorders talk. So I think this will be helpful. All right, so let's start here.
Okay, so why do we care, right? What are the stakes here? So this is with eating disorders in general, right? So about 9% of the US population, right? Almost 30 million Americans will have an eating disorder in their lifetimes. Uh, this is a huge, huge number. They're extremely deadly when it comes to mental illness, um, only after opioid overdoses, right? Uh, so this is something that we have to take extremely seriously. And over 10,000 deaths are from eating disorders themselves every, every year, right? So when we think about 10,000 deaths, I mean, when you do the math on this, it's almost one person every hour. Uh, I, actually, it's a little bit more frequent than that, actually, um, which is certainly a little morbid to think about. Um, when we compare to opioid overdoses, op opioid, I mean, I'm sure you've heard in the news and media. I mean, this is, you know, 100,000 deaths a year. But even comparing that, 10,000 is still, this is something we really, really got to get a hold of. Um, another statistic, you know, just over 25% of people with eating disorders attempt suicide. Uh, so this is something we definitely have to be on the lookout for. Uh, and this is not just something from the medical side. This is something that the community can also look out for a little bit more, right? The economic impact is also very, very high. I, I think I read a statistic somewhere saying that it was nearly $65 billion every year um, going into uh, these things related to eating disorders, the economic cost of eating disorders. You know, I remember reading something, um, it was from, I think, like a South Carolina website, you know, their, their health website. They mentioned that, you know, 10% 10 10 of people with anorexia nervosa, they die within 10 years, untreated, right, um, after getting the disease. And about 20% of people with anorexia nervosa will die within 20 years, again, untreated. So, you know, again, very, very serious things. And I hope this shows that this is something that is very important and we got to take seriously. Okay, so what are eating disorders? You know, basically, I mean, at, at, the, at the bare minimum, right? These are real serious illnesses that can be deadly. Um, and eating disorders have the potential to affect anyone, right? Regardless of age, sex, race, sexual orientation, okay? I know sometimes, you know, the media says, okay, no, it's just these young, you know, girls um, that get afflicted with these eating disorders. And that's simply not true. Well, certainly uh, it can be more common in that segment of the population, anyone can have an eating disorder. And so that's why we shouldn't try to uh, put these in the same box as far as that goes. Food addictions can be a total body disease, right? So the, there is a certain disease of the brain with, uh, with food addictions, but it's not a disease of just the brain, okay? So for example, and this is true in some part too for bulimia and binge eating disorder as well. You know, you can have low muscle, low body fat, you can have swelling around the heart, you can have seizures, kidney damage, liver damage, cholesterol issues, uh, low estrogen, testosterone, thyroid hormones, high stress hormones, right? And these medical issues in and of themselves can cause other medical issues, right? If you um, know someone or you've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, you know, that itself can cause a host of uh, medical issues on, on its own. So when we think of eating disorders, right, or food addictions, we got to think of the whole body, not just the brain. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about each of the eating disorders themselves, right? Like I said, there's kind of the holy trinity, right? Anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. And I kind of want to tell you some of the things that they have in common and some of the things that they have differently from one another so we can better tell them apart. So anorexia nervosa. Um, so anorexia actually is Greek for loss of appetite. And nervosa means, um, I believe from Latin, means nervous. Uh, and anorexia nervosa is actually kind of a misnomer. Um, right? Because the loss of appetite only happens about halfway through the disease. But one of the main characteristics in anorexia is this very intense fear of gaining weight. And when I say intense fear, I don't mean like, oh, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. It really means an intense, intense fear. Um, one of the big things with anorexia is this misperception of one's body weight or shape. And I think that's actually characterized really well by this picture, if you guys can see it. Right, this, this very like hectic, you know, very thin looking woman, like emaciated, right? But when she looks in the mirror, she doesn't see that at all. Um, in anorexia, there's a restriction of food um, and it has several types, restricting and binge eating type. You know, and about half of patients with anorexia, half have the restriction type, half have the binge eating type. And we'll talk about that also here in a second. So bulimia, uh, so a lot of people get, confused, you know, between the two. What's the difference between anorexia and bulimia? And I'm hoping this can clear that up. So what it shares in common with anorexia is that, it, again, there's this misperception of body shape and weight. Uh, but the difference is with anorexia, there's a restriction of food, 
like bulimia, it usually starts off with these episodes of binge eating, right? So what exactly is, is, is binge eating? Um, so there's this high amount of food that's consumed all at once that's way out of proportion to what someone might eat uh, in that amount of time. And there's usually followed by feelings of like, disgust, depression, anxiety. Um, and so these people that have bulimia, they have these episodes of binge eating, but then they have, again, because they have that, that fear of gaining weight, they have this kind of compensation uh, in their behaviors to try to lose that weight right away, right? So what do they do? They sometimes they exercise, um, like over the top exercise, you know, they're running 10 miles a day, they're fasting, they're using medications, diuretics, laxatives, um, anything to get down their body weight. You know, the difference is in, in anorexia, right? I, I showed you that picture, that woman looked very, very frail. People with bulimia, their weight can be totally normal. Their BMI can be totally normal. Um, so th those are some of the differences between bulimia and anorexia. And the last uh, food addiction I'll talk about is, is binge eating disorder. So this is very similar to uh, bulimia. Like I said, bulimia had the binge eating episodes but also that behavior to get rid of the weight. But binge eating does not have that, that compensatory behavior, right? And actually it's the most common eating disorder. And this is one of the most common disorders I see in the outpatient clinic uh, because you know, in outpatient, I see a lot of depression, anxiety, trauma, um, bipolar, these things. And binge eating often um, is comorbid with those disorders. Um, you know, I have a few notes on binging here, which I, I know I, I pointed out, right? So this is eating rapidly to the point of being uncomfortably full, right? Eating large amounts of food when not even that hungry, eating alone and feeling, feeling very, very guilty, almost like a shame about the eating episode. Okay, so I wanted to spend some time talking about understanding these, these disorders, uh, because I think by understanding it, it builds this appreciation for, uh, for what people that are struggling with these, dis what these disorders are going through. And I think also by understanding it, we can think of ways that we can help people to have it uh, and different treatment options. So when we deal with psychiatric illnesses, we think of something called this biopsychosocial model, right? So, so what does that mean? So that means we take into account someone's psychological factors, their social factors, and their biological factors. So let's dig down, right? What, what exactly do those things mean? So psychological factors, we'll start with that first, right? So this can mean like having a low self-esteem, a very poor relationship with someone, with yourself, feelings of inadequacy, depression, anxiety, fear, loneliness, right? Social factors look no further than, you know, social media, right? This is like your Instagram, your TikTok, your Facebook, whatever. Um, but it goes more than that. I think a lot of times when we think of social factors, we think of parents, but it goes above parents, right? When I know there's kind of that saying, it takes a village to raise a kid. So we've really got to look at everything. We've got to look at the extended family, right? We've got to look at the neighbors, the neighborhood, the school system, the teachers, the friend system, the bullying system. All these thing, things play a huge role in the social factors, and especially when someone is dealing with an eating disorder or food addiction. Now, I say biology for last. I, you know, when I was pre present, uh, sorry, preparing for this presentation, um, you know, I was, you know, going on YouTube, looking at a few presentations, and a lot of them focused on the psychological stuff and the social factors, which is really important. The presentations were great. I encourage you certainly, if you haven't already, to go on YouTube and look at the TED Talks, which are very, very good. I found a very few presentations actually looked at the biological side. Um, and I felt as a physician, I could spend a little more time on that. Uh, and I also think it's really, really interesting. So I hope I can share some of those tidbits with you. Um, so to start off with, some of the biological factors that can go into this are kind of like a history of dieting, uh, genetics, a family, dis a family uh, predisposition, right? If there's some genetics uh, involved here. I wanted to dig down a little bit more. This is where I, I feel like uh, it got really interesting for me also is to talk about the brain. Um, now, you know, the, the science of the brain involvement and in these food addictions is really complex. There's been research, you know, for decades on this stuff. And to be honest, it's not still fully completely understood, but there are some regions of the brain that we kind of understand a little bit. And I think when we talk about it, like I said before, I think we can try to develop an understanding and an appreciation for how maybe a healthy brain looks at food and how a brain that's dealing with food addiction or eating disorder looks at food. Um, so really here, I'm not trying to give you guys a neuro, like neuroanatomy lesson. I'm not expecting you to memorize all these parts of the brain. It's just to get a general sense of um, you know, how the brain can be different and how it perceives food differently. All right, so this is my, uh, 
you know, quintessential, uh, you know, holiday snack, right? Uh, you know, maybe it's already past this time if you know you celebrate Diwali or you celebrate Hanukkah, but for all you folks celebrate Christmas and I'll, of course New Year's coming up, right? I mean, who, I mean, not too many people will shy away from Christmas cookies, right? So this is kind of the example I'm gonna use um, to, you know, help explain um, maybe how a healthy brain versus a, an eating disorder brain may look at cookies. I think I included a picture of an Indian snack here, but you get the point. Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to talk to you guys about is uh, the occipital lobe, right? Again, don't worry about too much about the name, but why this matters is that that part of the brain actually helps control um, object recognition. And why this is important, especially with people that have anorexia, you know, if you remember that picture I showed you a few slides back, um, that picture of that woman looking in the mirror, you know, she was very frail, thin, looking at a person in there who looked certainly a lot more um, obese, right? Uh, this is this part of the brain working, right? So that part of the brain, it's not seeing uh, what they're actually seeing in front of the mirror, right? So for a healthy brain, we look in the mirror, you see yourself, you don't think anything of it. You're like, oh, that's me. But someone that has anorexia or something called body dysmorphic disorder, they're not actually seeing themselves accurately, right? As reality um, is. So I think of an animation, right? So, you know, you see this guy you know, standing in the middle, and that's what he looks like when he looks in the mirror, right? Or he looks at himself, he doesn't actually see himself. And that's because there are some problems with that part of the brain. And this is not under the conscious control, right? We don't will it, this is just what it is. Reward expectancy. So this is something that is controlled by part of your brain called the orbital frontal cortex. Um, and there's other parts of the brain too that control this, but this is one of the main parts. So what does reward expectancy mean? So that means, you know, you're at your, you know, you're at your Christmas party, you know, you see those cookies sitting there and your brain goes, as part of the brain goes, what's the reward? How good will I feel? Or what's the reward I get when I eat that cookie, right? And for a healthy brain, you know, we usually say, okay, it's, it's making me feel this good, right? I'm going to get 10 points worth of enjoyment out of, eat, out of eating this cookie. But for someone that has an eating disorder or a food addiction, um, and this is more in the case for someone that has anorexia, they may look at that cookie like as if one of us that has a healthy brain looks at a burnt cookie. Maybe not some of these other burnt, some of these burnt cookies actually look pretty good, but the ones on the left here, like these look pretty charred, right? So when someone with a healthy brain looks at one of these charred cookies, you know, you don't really think much of it. You're like, that's not gonna make me, that's not gonna, you know, make me feel good. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stay away from it. So hope you can imagine, right? Someone that has an eating disorder, when they look at a food like this, um, like these cookies, they're not seeing these cookies. They may be getting a sense of, oh, okay, there's nothing to be gained by eating this food. Okay. Emotional response. So this is a fun slide. Okay, so emotional response is, again, this is before you eat the cookie. How is the cookie gonna make you feel, right? Which is a little different than a reward. So reward is like, it's gonna make you feel that much better. Emotional is like, okay, it's gonna make you feel happy. It's gonna make you feel sad. It's gonna be delicious, right? How is it gonna make you feel? And that's governed by a few regions in the brain, uh, nam namely the hippocampus and the amygdala. So the hippocampus is kind of like your, your hard drive in the brain. That stores all your memory. And your amygdala uh, is something that governs something called a fear response, uh, something, called, and something that helps condition you. Um, so this is an experience that I think a lot of you can relate to. Uh, so if you guys have ever gone to get take out Chinese food or take out Indian food, right? You go out, you get the food, and then what happens? You get sick, right? Unfortunately, right? You get sick, you get diarrhea, you feel you know, nauseous, you, you feel terrible. You go to bed, and fortunately, hopefully by the next day, you know, you feel a lot better, right? And then what happens? You go to work maybe a day or two later, physically you're feeling better, and what happens? You have a family member or a coworker, and they say, hey, let's get take out Chinese food or Indian food. What instantly happens, right? Even though you feel fine, what instantly happens? You start feeling sick. Right? You're still feeling nauseous. You're like, man, I can't even think about that right now. Right? That's because you've had this conditioning. Right? Um, I include this picture of Star Wars Han Solo. I just, you know, that, not a pleasant image. Uh, I'm a big Star Wars fan, by the way. I'm, I'm sorry if I include too many Star Wars pictures in the presentation. But anyway, you get my point. Um, it's not a pleasant feeling. And that's, that's these parts of the brain's working. And we know in food addiction and eating disorders, that part of the brain may not work as well. Uh, so when someone that has, you know, for example, anorexia or bulimia, when they look at food, you know, for us, it could be that takeout food, right? That we had that bad experience with. But for someone that, with, with a food addiction, it could be any food, right? If you can imagine, if you have a healthy brain looking at cookies and feeling that way, looking at, your next, looking at tomorrow's breakfast and feeling that way, tomorrow's lunch, 
right? It's so pervasive. And again, this is not under anyone's control. This is just how our brain is making us feel. You know, I put this picture of this uh, old looking guy with a beard on the side. Um, let me bring up the chat. Does anyone know who this guy is? I'm just curious. Oh, I'm getting someone saying I need to talk louder. I'm sorry, can I? I'll, I will try to talk louder here. Um, does anyone know who this guy is on the side? I'm gonna bring up the chat um, about what I'm talking about, this conditioning response. Can anyone give me a guess? Freud, sure, that's, oh, you can't see the picture. Can anyone, can people see this uh, older guy with the beard? I know it's a pretty uh, generic. So let me give you a hint. Uh, it's a bearded guy. He helped with classical conditioning. He had dogs. Uh, if I say another word, you might connect the dots. Kind of a famous experiment with dogs. Pavlov, all right, someone got it here. Good, I'll give you an award if I could. Uh, yeah, so this is the Russian psychologist Pavlov, and he was very famous for classical conditioning. Right, Pavlov dogs with the bell, you know, and so he found out if you ring the bell, you know, you get this response with the saliva. So that's actually a very, very similar thing that's happening here. Um, that, and that, that's this part of the brain that's, um, that's being involved. So I hope that builds some connection, right? So again, someone with an eating disorder, their response to food, their emotional response is very, very different. Okay, cognitive control. And this is something that most people relate to. So cognitive control is uh, governed by several parts of your brain. So this is your, your anterior cingulate cortex, your uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex. Don't get too bogged down by the names, but this is something that, you know, when you look at a cookie, um, this is the part of the brain that kind of gives you that judgment, right? So for a healthy brain, when you look at a cookie, right? You look at a holiday party, right? Like let's say it's the 15th actually, right? So in 10 days, you know, you're having a Christmas party, you know, you, you see a bunch of cookies and a healthy brain will be able to look at the cookie and be like, hey, I really, really want that cookie, but it doesn't fit in my diet. It's only gonna make me feel good for about 10 seconds. So this is the part of the brain that helps with that control, right? Where, and this is kind of like what people who don't understand psychiatric illnesses, this is what they talk about. Well, why don't you just get over it? Why don't you just not eat, right? Or why don't you just eat more, right? This is the part of the brain they're talking about. And clearly, as I've showed you, it's not just that easy, right? But this is that part of the brain that we can exercise a little bit more, but we know does not work as well um, in certain disorders differently, right? So in disorders like bulimia, right? Which can have binge eating, or in binge eating disorder, we know this part of the brain does not work as well, right? And when it doesn't work as well, we don't have enough control. And what happens? The eating goes up, right? We see the cookie, we don't have that, that capacity to say, okay, these are the risk rewards. Let me consider all these things. We just jump to the cookie and we start eating more, right? Uh, now it's not just true in eating disorders or food addictions, right? We see this happening in anxiety. We see this happening in stress. We see it in depression and trauma. Um, in many, many disorders. So it, this is not certainly specific to food addictions. Um, interestingly, we actually see the opposite with anorexia, right? So anorexia is a massive control, right? So the, some people that have anorexia, they have such control over their diet and their body image and these things, they actually have too much of this brain control, right? It's very, very rigid. Um, so you can see that the, the brain responds in different ways to this. So uh, I think this will be one of the last slides I have on the brain, uh, but I think this is also actually very, very important. And this is more on the binge eating side and the bulimia side. So reward response. So this is actually, you know, I, I talked a little about reward before you eat the cookie. This is the reward you actually get after you eat the cookie, right? So the normal brain is you, you eat the cookie and now you feel like, hey, I felt good, right? It may only last for about 10 seconds, but you feel good about eating the cookie, right? Now, someone that has binge eating uh, disorder or bulimia, where they can't control that eating, what happens is, well, there's a few theories, right? So let me start with one of these theories. Um, I'll start with the second one here on the bottom of the screen, right? So the reward response is very low, right? So let's just say, I'm gonna make up a number. Let's say I get 10 points, you know, for myself, let's say I have a healthy brain after I eat the cookie. Someone that has a binge eating disorder, right? It's food addiction, they may only get two points. And I'm making these numbers up, but you get the idea from eating the cookie. So what happens? So they gotta eat, more and more cookies to get that, that same level, level of satisfaction, right? So that's one theory. And this is governed, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about the parts of the brain, but this is governed by you know, something called the VTA. 
and part of the brain and the nucleus accumbens. It's kind of known as like the pleasure center of the brain. The other theory is that as people eat more, the reward response is declining and declining, right? So initially someone that has an eating disorder or food addiction, they may eat a cookie that has 10 points. The second cookie they eat only may have six points and two points and one points. So they just keep on eating more and more and more and they're getting a declining response. Now this part of the brain is actually not just related to food addiction, right? You can see it in other, a lot of things too. I don't know if you've noticed, like this happens at Amazon shopping, right? Or gambling oh. um, or drug addiction. So very similar parts of the brain. Uh, so be careful again with your Amazon shopping or any of these things, you know, this, these, can, these things can happen. Um, you know, I'm actually going to skip this slide. I mean, if, and if someone wants to go back to this slide later, uh, if you're a little more medically inclined, I can go to this, but this is, gets a little more into the weeds. So I'm going to skip over this slide. So there's a lot of medical causes that can accompany eating disorders or food addictions, okay? And so when there's a food addiction, we don't want to say this is just a psychiatric disorder, right? There can be a lot of medical causes. I'm not going to go through all these things here, but I just wanted to give you a sense that um, it may not just be a psychiatric illness, right? There could be other things that could be causing it. And to complicate matters, there could be more than one thing going on, right? And that's why it's so important to see a doctor, see a psychiatrist, see a family medicine doctor to get sense of what's causing what. So what are the common warning signs, right? Let's say we have a loved one or ourselves are struggling. Some of the things that we have to look out for. Um, so come with it, some of the, I, to be honest, I pulled uh, some of these criteria straight from the National Eating Disorders website, which is a great website. I'm gonna give a link to it below. Um, but I, I'm just out of, you know, I just wanted to cite them to make sure that um, I credited them. You know, so if you see weight loss, dieting, control of food, right, those are big things. Food rituals um, are very big. So what is a food ritual? So a food ritual is when someone has, you know, these behaviors with the food, um, like they're, they're picking at their food or they're tearing in small pieces and eating. Sometimes they kind of self-sabotage their food, right? So they have like a bowl of cereal, they let the cereal get soggy so they don't have to eat it. They may burn the food um, or let the food go cold, right? So those are some food rituals. Uh, they may socially withdraw from situations because it makes them feel bad. It can be frequent dieting, body checking, extreme mood swings. There can be physical signs too. And while if it's a loved one, it may be hard to tell. If you yourself are struggling, these are some things to certainly look out for, right? So weight fluctuations, weight fluctuations, stomach complaints, dizziness, problems focusing, concentrating, sleeping, issues with uh, dental, skin, hair, nail health, right? Again, like I was talking to you about before, one of the first slides I said, like, you know, thyroid issues can happen with this stuff, which can relate to a lot of these other issues as well. So some things to look out for. Now some good news, right? So food addictions are treatable, very, very treatable. Um, and they span the gamut of treatment options, right? It goes everything from outpatient, which is the most basic, you know, to intensive outpatient IOP, partial hospitalization, residential, all the way up until inpatient. So I have a slide, a slide, sorry, slide, a slide on treating anorexia here, um, but I'm gonna talk about bulimia and binge eating as well. Uh, those are two also very, very important food addictions I wanna go through. So the good news is 25% recover completely, and that's with no treatment. Um, with treatment, that number goes up quite a bit. It goes up no, more to closer to 40 to 50%. And that's, I'm talking about, you know, big, big uh, improvements, uh, almost 100% uh, improvement. Uh, even in the remaining 50%, we can still get some good improvement in the symptoms there. Physical health is a definite priority, and I, I can't stress that enough. Um, we really got to make sure that we're not getting all these other medical um, fallout symptoms, right? And that's why it's so important to see a primary, a primary care doctor as well. There's a few treatment options um, as far as therapy goes, which is a, a cornerstone. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig down a little bit with therapy because I think these are things that we can do on our own and we can do with a therapist. And that's something I hope that uh, it can be a takeaway from the lecture today. Um, but just in general, right? So family-based therapy is very, very effective, uh, especially for anorexia, but even for other ones too. Uh, and this is especially good for adolescents that are struggling. And the way that this works is to involve the parents. Uh, and this is, it's, it's in, done in separate stages. One of the stages is first to talk to the parents, kind of absolve them of the guilt because parents can feel extremely guilty when the kids have an eating disorder. So absolve them of the guilt, kind of compliment them on the positive aspects of their parenting and encourage them to come up with their own plan on how to solve the eating disorder. Um, after that, they help transition the eating plan back to the kid, and then they work on a, developing a healthy relationship between the parents and the child. 
So especially for adolescents with a food addiction or eating disorder, family-based therapy is, is very, very, very good. Um, there's specialist supportive clinical management, which is a little bit uh, complicated. I'm going to skip that for now. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this is huge. And I'm actually, I'm going to spend some time digging into this a little bit more um, in the next few slides. I'm going to come back to that. Psychodynamic psychotherapy is very, very useful. Uh, the way this works is, um, you know, with a the therapist, it's first about developing a very strong relationship with the therapist and with the person that has a food addiction. And then after that's done, it's trying to analyze the relationship between their eating behavior and their relationships in their life and helping the patient develop some insight into what's going on. Lastly, you know, if outpatient does not work, inpatient should strongly be considered, right? Again, um, you know, outpatient is kind of like the, the most basic level of care, but if we need to, we have to consider higher levels of care to help. And those do exist. Um, I don't have specific slides, but I do want to talk about um, the food addictions, the bulimia as well, and the binge eating. So bulimia, patients do very, very, very well in therapy, especially when it's focused on the bulimia nervosa. CBT is first line. And again, I'm going to talk about CBT here in a second. And medications actually work quite well. Um, I didn't mention with anorexia, there's actually no good evidence for medicines uh, for anorexia. But with bulimia, um, SSRIs, you know, like Prozac can help quite a bit. They can help reduce the binge eating. And they can also treat underlying mood disorder, right? Because like I said, uh, in the binge eating episodes, they're often stress induced, right? There's a lot of depression, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress, and the binge eating comes as a result of that. So if we can treat uh, some of that mood, some of that anxiety with antidepressants, we can help with that binge eating. Uh, the best treatment for bulimia uh, and the binge eating is uh, medicine plus therapy, bar none, uh, by far. And that's the best treatment. The same goes for binge eating disorder, the other food addiction. Uh, therapy plus medicine is the best way to treat. Binge eating uh, disorder in of itself has a few more treatment options, uh, and we can talk about them more if you'd like to. I mean, that, there's some stimulants also like Vyvanse that can improve more focus and motivation. Um, it can also reduce that binge eating as well. That we're, and in my experience, it actually works quite well when used well. So therapy is pretty good. Um, you know, I, I hope I made that clear in the last slide. Um, you know, I put some of these things down that relate to the brain regions in the previous slide, like perception, if you remember these things, reward expectancy, cognitive control, emotional response, reward response, right? If you remember those parts of the brain, and I know it sounds almost too good to be true, but CBT actually addresses these parts of the brain as well. Um, and I, I included papers in the last reference slide, uh, actually showing the data that shows that CBT can actually strengthen those parts of the brain. Uh, so it's a very, very good, uh, I, I think it's a cornerstone of, of treatment for uh, food addictions or eating disorders. Uh, I put a funny thing on here. I mean, this is Sheila Lebeau saying it's, it's not quite magic, but you know, I didn't want to kind of oversell CBT, but it is very, very important uh, for the treatment. Uh, again, applauds for the, all the Star Wars pictures, but you know, so what is CBT? So it's based on the idea that psychological problems are grounded in faulty ways of thinking or learned patterns of behavior and that there are healthier ways to cope, right? And again, CBT, like I said, this is good from binge eating, bulimia, uh, that has binge eating and anorexia, right? Uh, so the CBT strategy is to first recognize the problem, right? And this is done with the therapist, right? Uh, recognize the issue, what's going on, um, learning to recognize that there's some distortion in the way that we're thinking and help them and help realize, okay, that's not what's actually happening in reality, right? Then there's understanding. Right? getting understanding of why we're doing such behaviors, right? then problem solving, using some problem solving skills to see how we can help better cope. And we'll talk about some coping skills in a little bit. And then confidence building. Once we learn some problem solving skills, learning some coping skills, how can we maintain those changes for the long term? So I have a few examples here I'm gonna read through and I, I hope maybe some of you, if you are struggling with some, uh, with maybe a food addiction or eating disorder, Maybe you can relate to some of these. And we're going to talk about how some skills can help with these particular people that are struggling. Um, so let me read through this really quick, but feel free to read on your own pace. I pull these directly from this book, actually, which I recommend uh, for eating disorders. Uh, it's, it's called Beating Your Eating Disorder, a Cognitive Behavioral Self-Help Guide for, for Adult Sufferers and Their Carers. Uh, so let me start with a few examples here. So Jenny is a woman who feels stuck in her life because of her energy because of her anorexia. It has tied her down so that she has not been able to develop 
partly because her fears have taken all her time and attention. However, her fear of change means that she has stuck with anorexia so far. Her second example, Katie is younger and has bulimia. Like Jenny, she has lots of anxiety about gaining weight if she eats normally. And that fear means that she is using a range of ways of calming herself, like with alcohol, self-harm, exercise. She is binging when she is too hungry or too upset. Polly is older than the other two women. Her concerns about eating, weight, and shape have been around for a very long time. And she deals with those anxieties by eating a limited range of foods, what she calls safe foods, and by vomiting when she has broken her own rules. She is feeling that her eating difficulties are seriously affecting her life. Her children have, have started copying her. She's having difficulties at work. But her fear of change has prevented her from changing. Uh, so when we look at these examples, uh, there's a common theme between all these, all these people that are struggling. Uh, any idea what that common theme is? What is the core belief here? Any guesses? You let can put it in the chat let box if you like. Let me, let me see if I can actually pull back to the last slide. I'm sorry. There's one, not good enough. Not good enough? Good. That they're not good enough. Yeah, I'm seeing a few answers here. Oh, these are really good. Yeah. Seeing lack of control, low self esteem. What else, what else do these, um, these people that are struggling have in common? All right, all right, so some good responses here. So let me bring it back here. Shame, that's a good one too. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. So I know this is kind of like, that's what I'm thinking. All you guys are definitely right. Uh, this is one that I've identified here. Uh, here. So this is the core belief that they all share. Uh, eating normally will have a negative effect, right? And that's true for all, all those three cases here. And this is something that we can address in therapy. Right? And this is a common uh, uh, thread in a lot of the food addictions as well. So let me talk a little bit about safety behaviors, right? And I'll relate this back to CBT here in a second. Um, right, so some of these safety behaviors, these, like these defense mechanisms that we have, you know, one can be avoidance, right? If you get mugged somewhere, you're not gonna go back to the place you were attacked. You know, if you are confronted with someone and uh, by some situation, you need to run away quickly because you don't like how it makes you feel. And some people can use negative behaviors uh, to help with how they feel, right? Like drinking, um, you know, overly exercising, these things like that. Uh, so why do people do safety behaviors? I mean, what's even the point of this? Uh, well, the people do them because they're actually useful. They actually help with short-term anxiety, right? But the long-term is that nothing's actually learned, right? People keep on using these short-term behaviors. Um, it helps with the anxiety in the short-term, but they keep on doing the same thing over and over and over again, and nothing actually ends up changing, right? So we're not changing any long-term behavior, and the anxiety actually ends up staying the same. So when we relate this to food addiction, right? What does that look like, right? So avoidance means like maybe not going to restaurants, right? You can't decide what to eat with binge eating, right? You're not checking your weight often because you're concerned that's a guilt again. Um, you avoid relationships, right? Because that may be the shame. The running away may look like, you know, maybe starting to eat, but then stopping eating again with the binge eating, vomiting to avoid weight gain, having some of those purging behaviors and using negative behaviors, right? And we talked about this, especially with the bulimia, right? With that food addiction, you know, like using laxatives, diuretics, you know, excessive exercise, right? So these are all behaviors that we see in food addictions that we can treat very well, actually, with CBT. So basic steps of CBT. So the, the core here is changing behaviors is the most important thing, right? We've identified these, these maladaptive coping behaviors that we need to change. And this I kind of touched on, right? So we're sacrificing some short-term benefit which is not easy, right? When you go into therapy, like some, you know, when people are struggling with food addictions, I mean, they do food addictions because they work, right? When you, when uh, there's binge eating, it actually works for a little while. Now, maybe, I mean, the, the, the amount of time that it's helping may be very limited, right? Oftentimes I hear from patients that binge eat, they're like, wow, I feel better for maybe like this when I'm eating and then right after I finish eating, I feel really bad, right? Some people say they feel good for a few hours, right? But it's very, at the end of the day, it's very short term, right? 
And so basically in the therapy, we're challenging that. We're like, okay, we have to sacrifice the short-term benefit to make these long-term goals, right? In order to make the connection that eating normally does not have a negative effect. And that can be difficult to do, uh, but that's what we do in, in therapy here. So application of CBT. So how do we do this generally, right? Now, the thing is with CBT, it's very, very specific for patient. It's very hard to give kind of give a general exact like, guideline of steps, step-by-step to, step to follow. Uh, but these are kind of generally what we will kind of work on, right? So the step number one is maintaining motivation towards goals of recovery with a therapist, right? Number two is developing a balanced plan of eating to stabilize the weight. Three, identifying beliefs about eating, shape, and weight. Challenging your beliefs. Again, with the health of a therapist, this can certainly help. Then resolving other issues that are in the way of the eating disorder. And then maintaining the changes over time, right? And this is how we get the long-term changes with eating disorders. So we got to get started. Right? So this is number one, with any, any food addiction or eating disorder, see a doctor first. And this is really, really important uh, if you are struggling with symptoms yourself. Right? Like I said, there's so many physical symptoms that can come along with this. It's good to get checked out. Step number two, get support from friends, family. Uh, and I actually have some online support groups, uh, uh, I think a little bit later in the presentation, which I'm going to share with you guys. Um, there's a lot of support out there. I know sometimes to see a doctor, it can be really tough. Uh, primary care doctors, I know it can be tough to get to. Psychiatrists, I know there's like these really long waiting lists these days. Uh, I'm sorry for that. There's, I know there's a lack of resources as far as that goes, but that doesn't mean you can't get help right now. Uh, like I said, I'm going to share some resources with you here in a second. Make time for therapy. Uh, I hope if anything, I, I really try to show you the role of therapy, uh, not even just to change some of those behaviors, but even in the treatment of even like those brain regions I talked about, right, that have such a control over these food addictions. Uh, so please, please, please make time for therapy, right? Schedule it in an hour every week, two hours a week. Um, you know, I know I, I get some patients sometimes that tell me, oh, I don't have time, right? Um, I'm so busy, you know, to get an hour a week. And my common response is then, uh, well, that means you need two hours a week, right? To, for therapy. So very, very important. Get a journal, the skills and food log. Also very important. Uh, without data, we're kind of, it's very hard, you know, then we kind of just get a sense, we're just going through the motions. Uh, it's very hard to get a track of what's actually changing, right? Whether it's binge eating, bulimia, anorexia, we got to track, 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 track. Doesn't mean every single day we got to track, but we have to have some idea of where we're at in a weighing scale. Again, I don't want that to facilitate bad behavior, right? Like checking your, checking the scale like twice a day or every day, but once a week, it is good to get a sense of progress that you're making. And I'm not saying the scale is just one thing um, doing, you know, doing that individually. This is part of the overall plan, right? Getting support, doing therapy, journaling, making sure physically you're fine also as well. So I included this slide. Again, I uh, shamelessly pulled this from the National Eating Disorders website uh, because I think it's, it's really, really helpful to have, you know, if we have people that we care about that are suffering or that we think that may be suffering from an eating disorder or a food addiction, these are some really good do's or don'ts um, to kind of keep in mind. So number one, and I hope this presentation has helped a little bit with this, is learn as much as you can about food addictions. Be honest and vocal about your concerns when you're concerned with somebody. Be caring and firm. Uh, so, and suggest they seek help. Be a, good, be a good role model. Practice what you preach. If you yourself are struggling, get some help, right? These are definite don'ts. And unfortunately, you know, I do see this in the clinic, especially when I see families. Um, so it's some things to keep in mind. Please do not place any kind of shame, blame, or guilt. Don't make rules or promises that you can't uphold. Don't try to give simple solutions. Um, and I, I kind of want to, because this also happens all the time, you know, just eat more, right? Oh, just stop eating, right? I mean, very, very simple. Like we hear this all the time. And I hope through this presentation, um, especially when talking about the brain, I hope there is a certain appreciation that these things are not under just our control. Right, this is really a you know a multi-brain you know uh, heart disease, right? And so it's not just something you know it's very invalidating when you say, oh, okay, just do these like two steps and you're going to feel better. So please don't do that. Uh, don't invalidate the experiences. Don't give simple advice about weight, exercise, or appearance. You know, for the reasons I said before. But even like I said, it's very invalidating. And also a very big thing is don't ignore or avoid the situation. The more that we wait, the more serious the symptoms can become. And like I mentioned in the very first slide or in the second slide, these things can be very deadly, 
And so it's very good to get on top of these things as soon as, as soon as we can. Okay, so here's a slide. So here, um, please get help, right? Uh, we have, I put two uh, links here um, for support. So one is the National Eating uh, Disorders Association, which is a great website. They have a very easy to use screening tool, uh, which is good to use. They have online chat options, crisis text line, they have support groups. Um, the other website here is the anorexia nervosa and associated disorders website, uh, which has free online recovery mentorship programs and free support groups. Um, you know, in addition to the stuff uh, I, I almost forgot to say, you know, there's other coping strategies to use too. Again, everyone's a little bit different with this stuff, but like I said, talk to supportive friends, you know, go for a movie, do, you know, use your journal for positive affirmations, you know, walk your dog, you know, play video games. Uh, there's so many good video games out now. Watch funny TV shows on Netflix. There's no excuse not to have, if you don't have a Netflix account, or if you do have a Netflix account, there's no excuse. I mean, there's so many TV shows that are coming on the next month. Um, these are other coping behaviors that we can use to help reduce that stress, uh, in, in addition to the therapy, right, and, and the medicine. Uh, so I wanted to include a, a few more slides, the last few slides here on prevention, uh, right? What, what's the saying? You know, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, so, you know, if you have kids or if you have someone that you feel like is going down this path, or maybe there is a family history of this, right, and you want to get ahead of it, but, or just if you want to just educate yourselves and, and your family and your friends, uh, these are some good things to keep in mind. So the big thing is education on media's portrayal of beauty, right? Uh, because listen, as much as we want to kind of ban Facebook and TikTok and Instagram from our kids' phones or anything like that, we can't stop, you know, adolescents from doing these things. It, it's going to happen, right? So the best thing is to educate, right? Talking about natural increases in fat, right? And weight with puree. Um, what does natural beauty look like, right? I think too often in the media, you know, we think that people need to have these six packs and, you know, bikini figures, and that's just not true. I mean, uh, so we need to reduce the importance of play, placed on body shape and weight for defining happiness and self-worth. Um, we need to educate on physical and mental effects of extreme dieting and talking about how to properly exercise and diet, what are healthy ways to diet and exercise. Um, you know, so a lot of things are also addressing the social factors. If you remember that slide I was talking about with the big mixing pot, you know, so the social factors are looking at the community, right? Looking at the school system, the, the friend circle, the bullying, right? The bullying is happening. We got to address it, get on top of it. Because that can certainly lower the self-esteem, which is a psychological factor, right? Which can play a role into creating these food addictions. Okay, and the last slide I have here. So I was kind of debating whether I should put the slide or not. Uh, I didn't want to detract from, you know, the true food addictions and, um, you know, the anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. But these are just some tips going into the holiday season. You know, if, if you don't suffer from an eating disorder yourself, some tips just to keep in mind, right? Going into this time where people typically gain quite a bit of weight. Um, so the first thing is, you know, when you go to the holiday party, when you eat, just eat, right? Be mindful, put your phone down, put down the laptop, turn off the TV, just be mindful when you eat. Uh, I'm sorry here, you know, so take your time, you know, savor the food you know, put the fork down between every bite. And there's no rush here, right? I mean, of course, you know, when you have busy lives, sure, you're, you're trying to like just scarf a meal down, but that doesn't have to be the norm. When you have the opportunity, take your time to eat. Reassess how you're feeling often, right? I mean, give yourself, you know, every five minutes or so, do a mental check-in with yourself. Be like, hey, am I feeling full, right? If you are, maybe ease up, right? I mean, uh, just check in with yourself. The last thing is be forgiving. Okay, uh, I know a lot of people can take it really hard when you know they come out of a holiday season and they feel like they eat really badly and they feel like they're going to gain a lot of weight. You're likely not going to gain a lot of weight after eating badly, you know, once or twice, right? So forgive yourself. But the most important thing is to learn from your mistakes. What happened? What habits can I identify? And how can you improve on them for next time? Right. So always be in that self-assessment cycle. Right. Things that you can do better. If you feel like you're you're having an ongoing problem with that and you feel like it is getting into this binge eating cycle or this bulimia, definitely reach out to a doctor or therapist so we can help you out. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, you know, I appreciate you guys for sticking around. I know that was uh, a lengthy presentation, uh, but I, I'm hoping that there were some takeaways, right? Just learning kind of the importance of eating disorders, food addictions, uh, and some ways that we can treat it and some ways we can cope as well. I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Bhaskar, and uh, we can open up to um, questions. Uh, just a couple reminders, though. 
I put in the chat box several times the Survey Monkey link. Again, I really encourage you to fill that out because we do use that for future program planning. And of course, we'd like to hear what you thought of the program. Uh, and we also have the recordings link. I posted that as well. And the recording should be posted probably in a few days. It usually takes maybe two, three days uh, before they post it just to review it. Um, so feel free to just kind of copy those links and then you can um, you can use the uh, recording link and you can fill out the evaluation and complete it now. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. So you could write questions in the um, chat box. And I think there was one that just came up recently. Uh, yeah. Dr. What do you mean by skills? Um, I'm assuming that's one of the slides I talked about. Um, can you clarify? Uh, let me see here if I go back. See if I kind of well, if I knew who it was. What do you mean like this slide when I say skills? Or I, I think I'm I'm sure I've mentioned it multiple times, so I just want to make sure we're on the same page with that. Okay, so I think someone direct messaged me regarding skills. So let me know. I'll get to the other questions here. I think um, it was Carol. Um so if well, Carol I think some of these questions are private, if you just want to make sure that they're not private. okay. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. You said oh, I was just gonna say that um I know if Carol it said that Carol had asked the question, so she would like to unmute. That's also another option now. I see. Um, Hello. This is Carol. Carol, there you go. I, I Hi, had Carol. A question How you doing? About skills and a journal for uh, to track skills and to track food. So. I understand tracking food, but I don't know what you mean by having a journal for skills. Sure, sure. No, so um, let me see here. Where did I? Yeah, get a journal this... for skills and food logging. Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? So these are, um, yeah, I, I, I think it was a little bit vague when I talked about that. So skills are certainly these, these coping strategies that you're practicing to help reduce some of that binge eating behavior, right? Or whatever behavior it is, right? And so the skill will vary, right? Uh, depending on the behavior, but it's trying to find the correlation, right? So let's say that you listen to music um, and that helped reduce some of the binge eating, right? For example. So I think trying to find that correlation, okay, you use this skill and this is the result, right? It helped reduce the, the food intake, something like that. Does that make sense? No, not really. Not really. Okay. Uh, so skills are kind of any of these coping strategies, right? Um, and, and that's really particular to you, right? So like I said, it's like it could be watching a movie, listening to music, um, uh, you know, talking to friends. Uh, so these are all oh, you skills. You need to keep more active um, so you're not thinking about food all the time. Yeah. So there's a variety of coping behaviors, right? I, I think you know, um, and so I, I think it's about using those behaviors and then seeing the impact of that on the actual food, right? On the behavior, right? Whether it's, it's binge eating or food restriction, these things. Oh, trying to find something that works. Correct, correct, That's right? Okay. Because, and yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I, I think I was certainly a little vague. So I think the, my, my point here was that I think if we don't, actually log what's working and what's not working. It's very hard to get a sense of exactly that. So I think being very objective and writing down, okay, I tried this skill, this coping strategy, and this helped, right? Or it didn't help, right? And I tried the next day and the stress was very high and I started binge eating more. I tried this skill and it didn't, and maybe it helped a little bit more, right? Whatever. That's what I'd like to see with the log. And I think that gives you and the therapist and doctor also some very good data to share, to, to show what worked and what didn't help. Does that clarify at all or let me know? A, a little bit. I, I was hoping that the focus of your discussion would be more on uh, how to stop compulsive eating, compulsive overeating, um, not necessarily binging or, or bulimia, but just a general overeating, too many calories, in the day 
especially, I mean, you're kind of focused, I think, on eating disorders of younger people, but I think older people, I mean, they, the latest study that I've heard is that metabolism doesn't really change until like age 70. Mm-hmm. So I'm 75. So sure. am I sure. lost cause or do I just- No, no, absolutely. Food? No, absolutely not. Okay, no, no so that's a good question. No, so you, I mean, you're wondering more about just kind of overeating in general. Right. And uh, uh, the habit of it and the habit maybe from younger years when you're more active. I mean, I'm still pretty active, but I'm not going to work every day and I don't have a set schedule. And Sure. No, no, that, that's a good point. Right. So, you know, I, I guess the first question is this, you know, is this a diagnosis or not? Right. And so binge eating is certainly like these episodes when you're overeating, right? So it sounds like maybe you're not necessarily binge eating, but you're having these moments when you are eating a lot, a lot of food, right? Right. So from, from the mental health perspective, right, at least what I'm considering, uh, you know, what I was mentioning is that we got to make sure that it's not in response to, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, stresses like this, right? Because that's where the binge eating usually comes on to, right? When it's followed by that, that guilt, that, that shame, right? So I guess the first thing is, you know, we have to ask why, like, why is the, why is that eating happening? Right. Is it because you're hungry? Are you responding to a feeling of like uh, of hunger or is it out of a result of stress? And I, I don't mean you specifically, but I, I think that's the first question that needs to be asked. And then we need to address that, that issue. Right. Okay. Uh, because, and that's a part, that's why I went to the CBT a little bit. Right. So I think it's identifying, why we do these safety behaviors, right? So if we're overeating, right, what is that actually helping with? So it's about recognizing what is that doing for you? Well, I think one thing I've avoid, I've uh, identified is that I avoid, I tend to be a procrastinator. Mm-hmm. So I'm avoiding doing tasks mm-hmm. that I don't want to do. So if I'm eating and then I have to take a little relax mm-hmm. then I feel a little t- tired but no so that, that's a great point right so you've identified that avoidance right there's some avoidance early there right and that's why you're doing those, those that behavior right so the treatment right is only to kind of really dive in to why you're avoiding these things and unfortunately, and I wish I could answer your question more directly, there's no quite simple exact solution uh, that's going to work for everyone and why exactly like you specifically are having those avoidance behaviors, right? Yes. But I, I think that's certainly worth the discussion. I think going, even going back to the journaling is to write down, you know, every day when these things are happening, you know, what are you avoiding? Why are you avoiding these things? Um, and, and is it working, right? If things are not working, what impact is that having in your life, right? Is it disrupting your relationships so just with the food, right? Like that. But certainly I don't think age should be a factor of that. Like I said, you know, binge eating, you know, overeating, these things can happen to anyone. Um, so it's certainly not too late uh, to make some of right. those changes. Okay. We, we, had, we had several other questions. So I just want to, for people that are uh, hanging on, there was a um, question about what dosage of Vyvanse uh gets the best result and i think there was sure. another one about vyance uh will vyance need to be taken for life for binge eating so they're kind of related uh what was the second question i didn't see the other one the... uh there was the dosage to get yeah. um the best results and then there was will vyance need to be taken for life for binge eating okay no those are great questions i'm trying to find i see the oh here okay um, dosage, uh, it really depends on the person. I, I'm sorry, I know that's a pretty generic answer. You know, the, the trick with Vyvanse, so Vyvanse is it's a stimulant, right? It's like Adderall. It, the, the drug is the same. Um, and so the first thing with Vyvanse is to make sure that it, uh, well, first we have to know when the binge eating is happening, right? Is this binge eating happening all throughout the day? Is it just happening at nighttime, right? Oftentimes I have a lot of patients, the binge eating is happening at nighttime, right? Because one of those characteristics you know, from one of those earlier slides I was mentioning, you know, usually people like to be alone, secluded. Um, but sometimes patients have so much stress that binge eating happens throughout the day. 
So the dosage uh, needs to be tailored to the point where it can give that full day coverage if it is happening every day. Um, and if it's just happening at a particular time of the day, right? If it's happening just, let's say at nighttime, then maybe it's a lower dose that's needed um, where they can take it a little bit later in the day, but not too late to disrupt their sleep, right? So really, so here's the thing. I, mean, I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but you know, Vyvanse, like I said, it's a stimulant medicine. It has FDA approval for binge eating disorder. Um, but just, I'll be honest, there's nothing really magical about Vyvanse, right? Um, it could be any stimulant, right? It could be Adderall, Ritalin, whatever. Now, the problem with the Vyvanse is that because some patients have binge eating disorder more at the binges at nighttime, binges, whatever you want to call it at nighttime, sometimes the Vyvanse is not that good because it's, it's an extended release and it can, it can disrupt their sleep. So sometimes I'll use an immediate release Adderall, right? Again, very similar drug, um, a small dose to help them binge eating at that time. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. So dosage, it really matters, right? It depends on kind of the frequency of the binge eating, when the binge eating happens. And I may not actually consider Vyvanse as first line sometimes because um, binge eating can happen at nighttime. Um, to address the second question, will Vyvanse need to be taken for life from binge eating? Uh, definitely not. Um, so, you know, binge eating, um, you know, uh, is really, a, it's a, a more of a surface level symptom, right? So the binge eating often, I don't want, not all the time, but often does not happen just like that, right? There's usually uh, deeper core issues that are causing that binge eating to happen. Whether we call it binge eating or core reading, um, anything like that, uh, there are those core issues. And that's why it's usually a combination of therapy plus medicine that work very well. So for my patients that have binge eating disorder or overeating uh, or bulimia, right? Um, when we really dig down to treat the depression, the anxiety, to tackle those things in therapy uh, and using the skills, all these things, their binge eating comes down uh, almost naturally, right? And so the Vyvanse, but what the Vyvanse can do is it provides that confidence, right? Because like I said, binge eating can be very, very shameful, right? So it provides that confidence, that motivation for patients to feel better about their weight, about their appetite, and that can lead to improvements in their depression, their anxiety with the therapist, which in turn will lead to reduced binge eating, right? And so as they're doing better, we reduce the Vyvanse and they do well. And several people asked about Overeaters Anonymous, what you thought about that, and if you recommend it. I recommend it. Yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. I think it's always good to have support, um, especially because we put so much, when I say we, I mean kind of society, you know, there's always this stigma with overeating and uh, with our weight and our appearance, and it can be really hard to reach out for support and to get validation from peers. So any organization that can offer that, I would certainly recommend. There's the question of how much of sugar addiction is physical as opposed to psychological? Uh, that's a good question. Physical versus psychological. Well, I, I certainly agree it's physical. Um, there's certainly physiological uh, things, right? With sugar cravings that we can get in the brain. Um, psychological. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. If, you know, I, I think certainly overeating is that has psychological components. I don't know if sugar addiction itself specifically has a psychological component to it, a strong psychological component to it. That's a good question. Let me get back to you on that, if you don't mind. I, I mean, I, I don't know. If I, to, to kind of dig into that a little bit more, you know, I don't know if it's so much the uh, sugar itself, as opposed to the sugar making you feel good, and that makes you feel better, but that's more of the physical reaction. So again, I, I don't know so much on the psychological side. Someone was asking about nighttime. <laughs> I can relate to that one. I guess, you know, overeating at nighttime. Nighttime, give me one second. Suggestions, <laughs> I'm guessing. Well, let, let me uh, maybe, um, let me talk about a few things. So. When it comes to binging at night, uh, especially from my point of view as a psychiatrist, um, from the medicine point of view, um, I'm thinking more of the short acting stimulants, right? I know these are off label, but again, very similar function to things like Vyvanse. Um, and when we do those short acting stimulants, right, they can take them, patients can take them a little bit later in the day that can help reduce that binge eating um, and not affect their sleep as much, right? Something compared to Vyvanse, which could affect their sleep. Um, and again, like I was saying before, I think that can improve um, that person's confidence 
because now they're not having um, those cravings as much. It can improve their weight, um, their self-esteem, and that kind of sets the ball rolling because now they're feeling a little better. So now the next day, you know, their mood is a little better. Maybe they're making more progress in therapy now. Um, and then we go from there. Um, but again, I, I think the, the real thing is, oh, I'm sorry. I hope yeah, I but we, um, someone asked if we could do that. I'm sorry. If we could take the presentation down. Did you want to leave it up? Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, they uh, asked if we could take I, I didn't touch it down. anything. <laughs> um, no, no, but really, I think one of the bigger things, because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions on the binge eating, um, on, on kind of treating it directly. I think the, one of the really important things that I want to really stress is that while medicines are, are good for addressing binge eating directly, it's not something that, at least in isolation, that I want to treat with just medicine, right? More often than not, uh, binge eating, there is a, a, a big psychological component to it um, that needs to be addressed. Right. I, I would say very, very rarely, I would say maybe like 5% of my patients, if that have just kind of like this organic, right. Um, just because maybe a part of that brain is not working well, that binge eating disorder, 95% of the time, there is some stress going on. Right. And it could be anything, right. It could be PTSD, you know, it could be OCD, depression, anxiety, just a lot of school stress, ADHD. I mean, all these things can lead to binge eating. So it really has to be kind of, uh, we have to look at it from all angles, right? And treat what's actually underlying to the binge eating. I, I hope that makes sense because I, I see this other question actually here regarding, you know, I can't pronounce the medicine name, the Gobi. I, I believe, I'm not too familiar with this medicine. I don't know if it's used too much in psych circles, but I believe this has a role in, um, actually one of the slides that I skipped, the energy allocation, right? It, it affects, I think, the insulin by, I'll have to get back to you, but I'm trying to find your question here, actually. Oh, here, here. What are your thoughts on what Gobi and food addiction? Do you feel like it helps to reinforce my positive behaviors? Or is it counterproductive and not helping to overindulgence of binging and just putting a bandaid on the problem? If the medication is removed from the regimen, have you ever seen uh, negative, negative behaviors immediately return? So unfortunately, yeah, I, I don't prescribe with Gobi myself, but I think the theme is still the same. Um, a Band-Aid band is not a bad thing, right? Just like how we were talking about those safety behaviors that people often use. Uh, people use safety behaviors because they work, right? So Band-Aids, they work. If you're bleeding, you put a Band-Aid on. Uh, so you can do other things in your life while you heal. So I, I, again, I don't have personal experience with this medicine in particular, but I think if it's something that can help binge eating, um, I think that's good, but certainly it should not be the only thing that's used. Um, I hope that answers your question there, but please um, ask a follow-up if that doesn't help. 